to this tour that we're providing you on video of this gallery exhibit in the main library on the University of Iowa campus. The name of the exhibit is The Pull of Horses on Local and National Histories and Identities. I'm Kim Mara. I'm a professor of theater arts and American studies here at the university. And I co-curated this exhibit with Mark Anderson, digital collections librarian in the Digital Scholarship and Publishing Studio, whom you'll be meeting very shortly. So I wanted to create this exhibit because I'm a theater and performance historian who happens to also be a passionate horse person. I uh, grew up with horses, I've loved them all my life, but they've always remained kind of to one side of my professional life. So at this point in my career, I, I was inspired to try to bring my two passions together, my love of performance history and my love of horses by studying uh, New York City circa 1900, at which time the golden age of Broadway and the golden age of the horse intersected. And in exploring that intersection and what it meant for the theater world, but also for the larger society, I was very interested in the question of, uh, first of all, just the enormous number of horses that were in the city that, that historians have generally looked past uh, because they're not horse people, so they don't necessarily key into it. But of course I do. Uh, and so I kind of kept track over the years as I was working on other projects. But with this one, I really wanted to put them at the center and think about what it meant to be in the city, in the theatrical capital at a time when on a daily basis, there were 130,000 horses moving and working among about 1.8 million people. So what did it mean in terms of the embodied sensation of just moving in the city and what impact did the horses have on society, on the performance scene, and on people's embodied experience of life at the time. I was also very interested in uh, the whole question of how I could bring this story, bring this study to people who, unlike myself, aren't necessarily horse people, how could I really express what those sensations were and the impact that they had. So I started trying to write a book. That was my usual medium, the usual scholar's medium. And I, I was really struggling because I had just had this experience of the horses like running off the page or, or leap, leaping away from what I could capture in words. So it, if you will, the horses were quite literally pulling me, and they pulled me right into digital media, which I didn't know anything about, but I'm very fortunate to have the digital scholarship and publishing studio available actually right next door to where we are now. So it was that move that then inspired uh, what you see going on behind me, which is an original documentary film. And I was drawn to this medium because I had a lot of visual material. Circa 1900 was a time of burgeoning magazines. There was a whole national industry of magazines that circulated, bringing the, the trend-setting social phenomena in New York City to the nation. So I had been collecting uh, some of those periodicals. There was also a lot of early cinema reality footage that we could get um, out of copyright from uh, the Library of Congress website that documented horses moving in the city, the moving picture camera being fascinated with horses because uh, they, they were what moved. And then there was my own personal experience of dealing with horses and the much smaller proportion of the population that still deals with horses today oftentimes in ways that are very similar to what happened 150 years ago. So the digital medium of the video allowed us to bring all of that together into a single medium. 
And it was very important in trying to convey uh, this sense of what it was like when, when all these equine and human bodies were moving together. Uh, it was very important that the film play at scale and that we could blow these, these visuals up. So hence the uh, nine by 16 foot screen. So the, the video brings a, a great deal of, of the movement into, into this room, into the exhibit, and into the experience. But of course, it's still two dimensional. So the other move for the exhibit was to combine the motion of the film with actual three dimensional artifacts and objects, which led to uh, the creation here of Big Fred, who is a, a scale model that Mark and I made with analog tools the digital librarian also being very skilled with analog, it turns out. And Fred is built uh, to the scale of a tall but fairly light-boned trotting horse. These are uh, still used today by the Amish for going up and down the road because they can trot very quickly. Many of them, in fact, are ex-standard bred racehorses. And so Fred here is uh, 16 two hands high and he's wearing a, a harness that was made by local Amish people. And he's pulling uh, a vintage cart that would have been commonly used as a runabout circa 1900. The cart also made by the Amish on uh, historical models. So it's, it's kind of the dynamic then between the two dimensionality of the film, the three dimensionality of the objects in the exhibit and really trying to put visitors to the exhibit in touch with, with the scale. So Fred and the other objects add that built dimensionality while the film provides the motion that was of course fundamental to the, the reality of humans and horses interacting in the city. I'm Mark Anderson. I'm a digital scholarship and collections librarian in the digital scholarship and publishing studio here at the University of Iowa Libraries. I work with a variety of digital materials, including the development of the Iowa Digital Library, uh, which includes resources uh, from the uh, special collections and university archives, as well as the Iowa Women's Archives. Um, and I also work on a variety of uh, scholarly digital editions uh, with faculty here on campus and at the beginning of the collaboration uh, with Kim uh, we we had envisioned how this uh, this film would be presented to the public uh, we had uh, a couple of showings of the incomplete film uh, both in um, more theater situations uh, where uh, where the 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 viewers could not directly interact with the screen. Um, and so we're, we're very excited to have this film being shown in the exhibit um, in this way, uh, which requires uh, rear projection so that, um, so that uh, people can walk up to the screen and not be um, blocked by, uh, by, the, by the projection. Um, we also wanted to have surround sound uh, so that the uh, the sounds the sound effects of the film um, could be more immersive and so we were very fortunate to also collaborate with Wade Ham Hampton uh, a 2018 uh, Bachelor of Arts graduate in theater arts um, who uh, did not only the uh, surround sound effects and Foley art um, but also did much of the vi video editing of this film the focus of the film is on New York City uh, at the turn of the 20th century. And so in, in order to bring uh, that to a more local audience, uh, the, the exhibit includes materials about Iowa and Iowa City in particular. So we're gonna be giving you this tour as, as though you were coming through the doors and starting your tour um, here at the, um, at the local side. We knew from the beginning as we were putting this exhibit together 
that understanding the pull of horses on national and local histories and identities had to include recognition of human use of horses as vehicles of both location and dislocation. Bringing horses with them from the old country, European immigrants used equines to carve settlements out of the prairie, fight battles, and remove Native Americans. So as we turn to human horse histories in Iowa City, I'd like to read the following acknowledgement of land and sovereignty by our colleague, Professor Jackie Rand in the Department of History and the Native American and Indigenous Studies Program. Quote, the University of Iowa is located on the homelands of the Iowa, Meskwaki, Ho-Chunk, and Ponca peoples. Many others have left their footprint on this territory now called Iowa. Although the Meskwaki people are the only ones with a permanent settlement in Iowa, others who have been forced out as a result of settler pressures, agricultural interests, and United States Indian removal policies remain attached to this land, culturally, politically, and socially. Through this land acknowledgement, we aim to reverse the historical erasure that has compounded disregard for native people and native issues, and to affirm the tribe's ongoing attachments to this land, whether they now reside in Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, or the Plains." End quote. Accounts of when and how Native Americans acquired horses vary, but by the 18th century, numerous tribes were already uh, acquiring them and uh, putting them to their own purposes, namely transportation, hunting, and fighting. Different kinds of horses and horsemanship became part of different Native American cultural identities. Jonathan L. Buffalo, Historical Preservation Director for the Meskwaki Nation, the only federally recognized Indian tribe in Iowa, reports that his people received horses after settling in Iowa in 1735. Over the years, the Meskwaki bred certain ponies to serve the tribe's purposes. Buffalo describes this breed of ponies as being similar to Appaloosas, but unique to the tribe and different from other lines of American Indian ponies. These horses remained with the tribe during their removal to Kansas and came back with them to Iowa when the tribe returned. But by 1900, in an attempt to stop the tribe from roaming the state, the US government shot and killed most of the herd. This 1905 photograph at the beginning here of the exhibit shows Meskwaki youths mounted on two of the remaining ponies. By World War II, notes Buffalo, the last Meskwaki ponies and horses were gone, while white European bred horses, of course, continued to multiply. This wall introduces the Iowa City Life section of the exhibit through the use of Sanborn Company fire insurance maps. And although functional in nature, they are very much works of art. What we have done is include about 30 blocks of downtown Iowa City. Um, and what's amazing about these maps is they show just how many businesses were devoted to uh, the requirements of, uh, of, of horses. There are uh, nearly 190 stables and blacksmith shops um, that would need to hand forge horseshoes such as this one. Additionally, this map shows the location of a fountain that was used for uh, watering horses and taking care of their bodily needs. Um, there is also pointing, pointed out the location of the firehouse um, of the Alert Hose Company that was the uh, home of Snowball and Highball, Iowa City's celebrity fire horses, which we'll be talking about more about later. This first case next to the Sanborn maps includes some of the earliest uh, photographs of Iowa City, especially showing the changes um, along uh, Clinton Street from the mid 1800s to the late 1800s. Uh, there's even a photograph of the county fair taking place on the Pentacrest outside of the old capital before the county fair was moved uh, just to the east of town. 
there's also a photograph uh, showing the uh, an, an Iowa City Parade uh, fire wagon with an African-American coachman on Clinton Street in 1893. The African-American coachman driving this ladder wagon was one of the very few people of color, less than 1% of the population working in Iowa circa 1900. Many worked not in agriculture, but in cities and towns of a thousand people or more. The occupational category in the non-agricultural horse industry from which most men worked their way to coachmen consisted of draymen, horsemen, teamsters, etc. Draymen were single horse carters, horsemen were grooms and hostlers, or stable workers, and teamsters were drivers of two or more horses pulling wagons. The African-American coachman was a relatively conspicuous figure in this period, as several drove carriages for presidents in Washington, D.C., including Albert Hawkins, who drove Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, Chester A. Arthur, and Grover Cleveland. William Willis, who drove for Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison, and Charlie Lee, who became Theodore Roosevelt's coachman for 30 years, spanning both his years in office and retirement to New York State. The job carried certain prestige and provided a good livelihood. At the same time, it made the coachman a highly visible servant of the carriage owner, whether the US president, a wealthy private citizen, or the local fire company. In all cases, success in the position demanded keen knowledge of the horses and a high level of skill at the reins. So this case takes us a little further into uses of horses in the local economy. And this beautiful picture up top here is depicting the Waterloo Artificial Ice Company. Among the, the services that horses had to provide were, were those deliveries. And of course, ice was necessary for refrigeration at this time. So that was actually a fairly major delivery service. And you can see that it's, it's a matched pair of horses pulling that ice wagon, ice being very heavy. Um, uh, the people who use draft horses like to have a pair that are related because they tend to look alike and therefore can, are built alike and can pull more evenly and therefore work together more efficiently. Also notice uh, that these horses are both covered with um, the, the version of fly netting that existed at the time. You could actually purchase this in one of the several harness shops in downtown Iowa City. Those were necessary because while horses are, are big, strong animals, they're actually also very sensitive. A horse can feel a fly landing anywhere on its body. So to, to keep the horses happy and, and working well and not expending energy trying to swat flies off, uh, their, their handlers would put these um, fly nets on them. The other great thing about horses is that they're herd animals and therefore uh, can be trained to work well together drawing on their herd instincts so they can um, be taught to pull well in teams which again is helped by them being of similar physical stature. They will also take direction from humans because they associate humans with their herd leaders and are uh, conditioned to, to follow, follow their leader. That's a big key to how humans got all this work out of horses uh, for millennia. Also notice the, the size of the feet of these two draft horses here, and you can see that they've got some pretty substantial shoes on, uh, part of what was keeping the blacksmiths busy at the time. Now down below, we have a whole set of photographs that came to us uh, care of the Iowa Women's Archives. This is from the family collection of Nancy Pesha, an Iowa City resident to whom we're, we're very grateful. And these are depicting some scenes of people driving horses and buggies, which were common vehicles to, to take to town at the time. And uh, Nancy's family was in the livery stable business. She has a, a relative who ran the largest livery stable in town. So that's depicted here in this uh, larger photograph as well as down here. Uh, it was the, the, the Graham and Son livery stable. 
the livery stable was a pretty crucial phenomenon in the period. It served a number of functions. There were people who um, didn't want to own horses themselves, being that that's a fairly large responsibility. So a livery stable was a place where you could rent a horse for a certain amount of time. You could even rent a horse and carriage. As importantly, the livery stable also provided a place for horse owners to put their horses when they came to town. So if you, if you lived uh, around Iowa City and needed to drive your buggy to town, what were you going to do with your horse and carriage while you shopped or did business for several hours? It's not like a car, you can't just pull it into a parking space and expect it to stand there all that time. So you could take, take it to the livery stable, you could pay by the hour or even keep your horse and vehicle there overnight and your horse would be taken care of and fed uh, and watered and so on. Downtown Iowa City had about eight livery stables in 1900. That's how necessary they were. Uh, again, the, the Graham business being the largest. And then down here in the corner is a laundry truck uh, this also is, is from the Pesha collection, and this was the, the COD laundry. Um, that business was located on Washington Street in, in uh, the spot where the Blue Moose Tavern is now in Iowa City. Um, but notice that the horses have sheets over them. Uh, horses, too, needed clothing and also needed laundry. So uh, horses, you know, having to stand around, whether in the hot sun or uh, in the cold, need clothing. So horse clothing was as, as significant a commodity as human clothing in the period. In these two cases, we are featuring uh, some diaries from a prominent Iowa City family. Both are in the Iowa Women's Archives. They're in these adjoining cases, one here and one here. Um, this, uh, these are the diaries of members of the Byington family. Those of you who know Iowa City uh, might also be familiar with Byington Road, which runs just on the near west side of town. Uh, it comes into Grand Avenue near the, the Hillcrest dorm. Uh, well, that was the road that went into the Byington farm. The farmhouse was about three quarters of a mile from downtown. Uh, the Byingtons farmed. They also um, worked as attorneys in town, at least the men of the family did. And part of what's interesting about these diaries is they give us kind of the, the gendered view of life with horses for a fairly well-to-do white middle to upper class family of the time period. So the, the sister, Iowa Byington Reed, uh, she married William Reed, um, kept her diary extensively. We have some 21 volumes of decades of Iowa Byington Reed's chronicles of her daily life, which is a real treasure trove uh, for all sorts of information about life in the period, uh, but she also makes reference to the animals on the farm. She helped out when necessary, although her primary occupation was as a seamstress and a homemaker, but she would record what was going on with some of the animals, especially the horses and especially the mares who were giving birth to foals every year. So for example, uh, an entry for Sunday, April 3rd, 1892, Iowa Byington Reed writes, I was busy about the seamstress work all the forenoon. Then I had one of my spells with my stomach in the afternoon. The whetstones were over and Hattie and Edith stayed and helped mother get supper. Will found old Pat had a nice little colt when he went to the barn this morning. And then she writes on Tuesday, September 13th, that same year, I hurried through with part of the work this forenoon, by work she means her sewing, and walked to town, then paid for a ride to the fairground and back to enter mother's bread. Will went up in the country this morning for another colt to break. After dinner, mother and I went out to Wolf's and did not find them at home. We stopped at Folsom's on our way back. 
Will was out to the fairground a while. I read in the evening. So they're, they're getting around to all these places visiting with their uh, various horse-drawn vehicles. Okay. Now, um, Robert Byington's diary here is much shorter. He only kept the diary in the last year of his life. Sadly, he died at age 30 from an illness, but um, up until he became fatally ill in that year, he kept a close chronicle of his daily doings, uh, both working at the office and uh, working on the farm. So he writes on Friday, June 22nd, 1883, Today is the seventh anniversary of my graduation from the academic department of the university. I did the milking this morning and spent the forenoon in the garden cleaning up our early potatoes. Auntie Walker and Sally Hart were here uh, to visit and then Otto and I rode over to town in the Phaeton, that's the, the fancy family carriage, after dinner driving John D. That's one of the horses he bred on the farm. I did some running around. I spent the balance of the afternoon in the office conversing with Mr. Price, Alice Holson, and Almia Nelson, and then we took tea. I then did some measuring in the yard. I then saddled my horse Jim for the first time and rode him over to town to have the horse doctor see him. So you can see from these entries how intricately the horses are interwoven into the lives of these people and into their respectively gendered activities. In keeping with our approach to the exhibit of combining digital with actual material objects and interspersing those throughout to keep those material dimensions present, we have here in this case displayed along with the diaries um, some antique bits that would have been used on the driving horses. So when uh, Rob Byington went and, and got harnessed up his horse to drive to town, he would have used bits similar to those that you see there in the case. And next to the bits, we have a, a leather noseband that was part of a horse bridle. And one of the uh, wonderful aspects of leather is that it becomes more beautiful with age as it absorbs skin oils and sweat from the interaction of human and equine bodies. So this is uh, an older nose band and definitely carries those traces of human and horse interactions. Now these Byingtons would have grown up with horses, obviously, so um, you know it was kind of a natural extension of what they were used to, to, to breed them and train them from youngsters to mature horses. And you can see here in this uh, photograph that we've put in, in an oval frame, a young boy of the period uh, already practicing some of the horsemanship skills that were necessary to maintain horses with a toy horse there in, in the background of the photograph. And just below it is a picture of a gentleman driving a buggy uh, with uh, a team of two horses. And he was uh, a local salesman who went around to Iowa City and other towns selling a, a medicine for horse galls. Those were sores that horses could get when harness rubbed on them. So uh, remedy, remedies that purported to be good cures for those sores were much in demand. And this gentleman could make his livelihood mixing up this gall medicine and driving around and selling it to uh, local people like the Byingtons and others. This final case in the Iowa City Life section is devoted to Snowball and Highball, who were Iowa City's uh, fire horses for nearly 15 years. They were housed at the Alert Hose Company number two, which is identified on the maps as being the current location of Oasis Falafel. Snowball and Highball were uh, very much documented during their time uh, working for the hose company. Uh, and so we're fortunate um, to have a number of photographs from the State Historical Society of Iowa of Snowball and Highball in action 
um, running to the scene of a fire, um, standing uh, still uh, while, while a fire is actually being uh, put out, um, what we think is over on uh, Rochester Avenue, um, and, and also out at the fairgrounds. Um, from Special Collections, uh, we have uh, uh, a writing uh, from, that was a part of a WPA project uh, during the Great Depression um, documenting the lives of Snowball and Highball. Um, Snowball and Highball uh, retired from uh, service in 1925 um, and, and sadly um, after, uh, after one died, the other died then soon after. Um, but we're very fortunate um, to be able to um, show these two uh, beautifully matched white horses um, who did um, so much work for uh, the city of Iowa City. This bit of folklore was written by May Christensen in 1936 and describes Snowball and Highball. It reads, Snowball and Highball were a beautiful snow white team of horses owned by the Alert Hose Company of Iowa City. These horses were famous in the community for their sagacity, or in other words, good horse sense. Whenever a fire call came into the station, they were ready for the run as soon as the harness dropped on them and the word was given. Then away they would dash to the fire, and no matter how long it lasted, they could be trusted not to leave the spot where the firemen had left them until the fire was out and their driver headed them homeward. Their beauty made them very attractive, and their splendid speed and patience enabled the firemen to save much valuable property about the city. So everyone in the community had a kind word and thought for Snowball and Highball, and became much attached to them. Sometimes the firemen entered this team in races at firemen's tournaments, and they never failed to win the prize money and came to be known as Iowa's most beautiful fire team. In 1928, to meet the growth of the city, the alerts discontinued the use of the hose team and replaced them with a motor fire truck. Snowball and Highball were then retired to a farm to spend their last days in ease. It is to be feared, however, that they were not treated with the same care and kindness they had been used to and so richly deserved. But, be this as it may, in about two years Snowball died of old age, and shortly after, Highball also passed on to his final rest, for after searching everywhere for his lost mate and whinnying at every white horse he saw, thinking it might be Snowball again, he evidently died from grief and a broken heart. So this corner of the exhibit is devoted to Iowa's role in draft horse production. Um, and we start with uh, a beautiful, large chromolithograph um, that uh, the State Historical Society of Iowa uh, loaned for this exhibit. Um, and it, and it um, depicts the Holbert Horse Importing Company in Greeley in Delaware County, Iowa. So uh, up near uh, Manchester. Um, and um, and it shows on all the buildings, um, particular breeds uh, that they imported, Percherons, Belgians, and English Shires, um, and, um, and really uh, with a number of, of horses shows how um, large and important a business uh, this was to draft horse production in Iowa. Between 1870 and 1945, the state of Iowa, with its favorable climate and available grass, hay, and grain, became a leading producer of heavy draft horses for farming and urban labor. While lighter horses, such as Morgans and Standard Breds, were needed for common carriage driving, larger animals were required to power heavier machinery. Among immigrants from other countries, many of Eastern Iowa's settler humans came from Germany and Bohemia, part of the modern day Czech Republic. The favored draft horse breeds came from France, Belgium, England, and Scotland. Each breed is distinctively colored. Percherons from France are usually dark gray to white as they age. Belgians are a golden chestnut color. Shires from England are black with white lower legs and Clydesdales from Scotland are bay or dark brown with white lower legs. The first Percheron stallion named Duke of Normandy was imported to Iowa in 1869 by A.W. Cook of Charles City. Percherons became the most popular American draft breed. 
Iowa City's W.H. Jordan was a pioneer importer of and breeder of Shire horses. By 1900, Iowa surpassed Illinois as the top draft horse producing state. The peak years of draft, draft horse breeding, when the number of horses on Iowa farms exceeded 1.5 million and the farm value per head rose to $120, were 1910 to 1915. Iowa's iconic farmland was carved out of prairie sod and forests by these large horses working alongside humans. Equines bred here were shipped around the country to build and power cities as well as agricultural production, and thousands more were shipped overseas to fight U.S. and foreign wars. This photograph here from the Library of Congress depicts a class at the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in, founded in 1868. The Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute was founded by General Samuel Armstrong to train African-American educators. These educators taught students the knowledge and skills to become gainfully employed and self-supporting as craftsmen or industrial workers. The class of Hampton students pictured here is learning about the features of different horse breeds from the heavier gray Percheron draft type to the smaller Morgan or Cobb type to the taller leggier thoroughbred or standard bred type. Although standard jobs in the horse industry were still almost exclusively male, female as well as male teachers needed basic equine knowledge and skills to pass on to their students. Whether students pursued professional employment with horses or not, all races and sexes had to coexist with them in their daily lives. This panel and this case feature Magdalena Helen Tiley, an extraordinary woman whose papers are also in the Iowa Women's Archives. And Helen Tiley came from Koblenz, Germany. She came to the United States as, as the wife of American soldier Ben Tiley, whom she met in, in Europe. So they came back together to the US during the occupation of Germany following World War I. They raised their daughter Peggy here and farmed in the Toddville and Springville areas of Marion Township in Lynn County. Then when Ben was stationed in Texas and Florida during World War II, Helen ably ran the family farm, like many women did who were left at home and who proved they could indeed do traditional men's work, including handling draft horses, as you can see her masterfully doing on that, on that panel. Now, whether wearing uh, her farm overalls, as she is in that photograph and the one below it in the stable where she's feeding the horses, or here in, in a dress uh, petting one of the draft horses who's out to pasture uh, with its head over the fence, you can see her affection for and comfort for these animals. She also left us this album, which is in the Iowa Women's Archives. And uh, in it, she has a number of newspaper clippings and photographs. Um, she, at one point, was interviewed by the Waterloo, Iowa radio station about her experiences as a German immigrant coming to Iowa. She compared Iowa with Germany, which of course was also a very horsey place during much of this history. And she talked a great deal about how she managed to handle the farm without her husband. In 1942, the Cedar Rapids Gazette came out to her farm and that's how we have a number of these pictures of her doing chores. They, they published a piece about her entitled, She's a Soldier Too meaning the work she was doing at home on the farm with the horses while her husband was away was supporting uh, these, these war efforts. Because horses were so important to life and the economy in this time period that we're talking about, it was a matter of state concern, the quality of the breeding stock. So the Iowa Department of Agriculture published uh, these, these registration books annually in order to uh, put out their record of which stallions were approved for breeding and also significantly which were not to ensure that people went to the approved stock in order to, um, uh, to keep, keep the breed standards going. 
the, the tables of contents of these volumes are, are pretty interesting. They talk a, a great deal about the, the management of the stallion, the housing and care, the grooming, uh, and so on. And this is uh, a leather halter and uh, the sort of chain uh, lead that is sometimes used in order to handle stallions. This doesn't hurt, hurt the horse, it's just a little extra uh, control like you would for a large rambunctious dog. And oftentimes uh, the name of the horse would be inscribed on a brass plate on the halter. Uh, these folks who handled these breeding stallions were, were very proud of them. There, there was a certain amount of identification between the stallion's owner and the horse itself, both very proud of their potency and their being touted in the registry as exemplary specimens. So here we are showcasing uh, Iowa native Phil Strong, who became a very well-known author and published a number of novels, including State Fair in 1932 and Stranger's Return in 1933. These are novels which help perpetuate the mythology of the quintessentially American farm life in Iowa. Uh, his book State Fair also became the subject of uh, a Hollywood film. But in addition to those novels, he also wrote nonfiction. And in this book, Horses and Americans, he chronicles how horses together with the farmland were fundamental to American national identity uh, from the turn into the 20th century as, as we're talking about. Um, this is a beautiful first edition of this nonfiction work called Horses and Americans, and it's got some artwork inside it that we're showcasing here, which is a painting by John Stuart Curry of some Belgian horses famously bred in Wisconsin, along with Percherons, as Mark mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Belgians were very popular draft horses and continue to be favorites at the Iowa State Fair to this day. This freestanding case is devoted to uh, horses in agriculture and industry in Iowa um, and showing some uh, uh, pretty amazing uh, work that could be done um, with a team of horses. Uh, there's a photograph of horses moving a house um, and, uh, some, and horses in the winter um, doing work that required them uh, to be wearing horseshoes um, that often had uh, attachments and cleats that allowed them to work in snow and ice. Horses were critical to the success of Iowa, Iowa's farms and local industry. They pulled plows, delivered goods, and hauled materials, and allowed for faster travel and more. The selection and reproduction photographs from the State Historical Society of Iowa are seen in this case. Uh, while these photos are not available to view online, the State Historical Society of Iowa has an excellent collection of images by A.M. Wetok and others which give an authentic depiction of rural and industrial life in Iowa. This case brings us back to Iowa City and the campus in particular. Horses were present when the University of Iowa was being built and assisted with moving building materials and with the construction itself. 120 years ago, horses powered the winches and cranes that erected the Hall of Liberal Arts and Sciences, now known as Schaefer Hall. In addition, horses played an important role in parades. They provided a mode of transportation, but they were also stately and impressive. Horses were not only workers, but also actors, as in this photo of uh, a Greek temple that was built for uh, some kind of a theatrical production in Lower City Park. And uh, if you look closely among the uh, actors in their white robes, you can see uh, a horse standing in front of that temple. This case, uh, which is um, devoted to women's riding circa 1900 in this exhibit, 
contains many of the archival materials that first inspired the, the film that's at the center of this exhibit, including a number of items that I personally collected on eBay and actually some that came to me from uh, my, my maternal horse-owning family, specifically my, my family that bred thoroughbred horses and participated in both horse racing and upper level horse sports. So I, I'm somebody who comes from uh, that world and that culture which directly connected me to some of these activities that are um, uh, displayed here in this case that went on in New York City in the period that we're talking about. So I mentioned uh, in introducing the exhibit that I did have a lot of visual material, uh, much of it coming from uh, these uh, periodicals that you see represented here, Harper's Weekly being a premier periodical that circulated at the time. And you can look at, look at that very detailed, beautiful engraving, and you see a, a woman riding side saddle. So notice that both her legs are crossed over on one side of the horse. Well, in the period that we're talking about, in fact, throughout the 19th century up until 1915, it was considered de rigueur for respectable women who rode to ride side saddle. The aim being to protect women's chastity, supposedly by preventing them from spreading their legs over the horse. Now, as someone who's ridden all my life astride, it's rather mind boggling to contemplate riding side saddle, though I, I did have to try it. And I can tell you that it's, it's very challenging and feels very unnatural and asymmetrical. But remarkably, the women in the period that we're talking about who were required to ride that way to retain their respectability became really good at it because it turns out, as you can see nicely illustrated in that Harper's picture, you can see how much of that woman's uh, lower body is in contact with the horse. Side saddle actually gives you more uh, kind of square inches of your seat, which is a critical area for riding a horse to put in contact with the saddle and to communicate with the horse powerfully through uh, your lower body. The women figured this out and became very adept as side saddle riders uh, competing with men in different horse sports and uh, of course riding out socially and uh, looking uh, very fashionable in their, in their side saddle attire. Horseback riding took off as a popular sport for women amid a burgeoning physical culture movement at the turn into the 20th century that was also connected to uh, women moving into higher education and into professions more generally. They also wanted to be more in their bodies and riding horses was considered uh, healthful exercise. Of course, there were detractors who were convinced that if women rode horses, even side saddle, that somehow it would unsex them and, uh, and ruin their femininity, potentially disable them from having children, which of course was not true, but nevertheless, that was, that was what some people feared. Uh, well, by the 1880s, there are enough women riding uh, and enough people concerned about their riding that we get the publication of the first manual written by an American woman for American women about uh, the prescribed mode of horsemanship. And that's the volume featured here uh, that's open. It was called The American Horsewoman by Elizabeth Platt Carr. And we were fortunate through Interlibrary Loan to get an original first edition that's on display. And you can see that Carr has uh, drawn a picture from the rear of the proper lady seat side saddle. You can see the erect posture. You can see how both legs are over on the left side of the horse. And she conveniently includes another drawing here that shows you just exactly how the lady is holding on to the horse while seated in this fashion by means of these two pummels that are protruding out of the saddle 
that she can uh, hook her knees into. So essentially she's crossing her right leg over the, the front of the saddle and hooking her knee around that pummel and then the left knee is coming up underneath it so that instead of gripping the horse itself, she's actually gripping uh, uh, those two pummels between her thighs in order to stay on. But again, she's got all that surface area of her seat in contact with the horse to use. And she has the use of her left leg on the horse. So part of the art of side saddle is compensating for the absence of the right leg, usually by carrying a crop on that side and using it as, as though it were your right leg. Now, part of why side saddle was required for women was not only this whole thing about protecting chastity, but also um, it, it, uh, it kind of elevated women into this elegant pose that men liked looking at. So it showed off women's bodies in, in a way that was pleasing to men. And it was also thought to keep women dependent on men. And Carr includes an extensive description of the choreography, and she's got a drawing here on this page of what it took for a gentleman to assist a lady rider side saddle for getting on the horse. And it, it's kind of a, a bizarre exercise, and it's very intricate. It's sort of akin to a man having a part to play in leading a woman in ballroom dancing. I mean, that's the kind of choreography we're talking about here for how to help her get on the horse. Um, now, significantly, women figured out how to mount all by themselves, uh, which you know you have to do by actually throwing your right leg all the way over the horse and then bringing it over to cross it over the front of the saddle. And that, of course, defeated the whole purpose of side saddle, to have to spread your legs to get on the horse before crossing it over. That was to be avoided, wrote Carr. But again, women figured out how to do it uh, and did do it and became very independent riding side saddle. Um, one thing that Carr advocates in her book uh, is that women should not leave all of the care of the horse to servants, that, that to uh, ride a horse well, you need to have a good relationship with the horse on the ground. That's, of course, part of a, a horsemanship ethic that's been handed on through the ages. And here we have a, a vintage uh, horse grooming brush um, that's leather backed and bears th those wonderful body oils that uh, burnish into the leather uh, that's used for, for grooming. Um, that's uh, an item that I actually grew up with and, and has groomed many, many of my family horses. Now, as a result of these practices of becoming intimate with their horses, grooming them, and uh, becoming very adept riders side saddle, uh, which kind of mystified men, because again, if, if you've been riding astride, to contemplate riding side saddle is, uh, requires a leap of the imagination. And for a man to try to do it himself would be akin to cross-dressing. So, uh, you know, no doubt that went on somewhere, but I haven't yet found any pictures of it from the period. Um, uh, but at any rate, the men were, were, were mystified watching these women become so good, even able to, to jump and do all kinds of things with horses, side saddle, that the humor magazine Puck, and that's what this page in, in color here is showing us, that's, that's uh, an original from Puck, is showing the woman's body actually having merged with the horse's body as, as they become centaurs, uh, so adept were they. And, and so sensitive to, to these horses and communicating with them through their bodies that the two merged as one, much to men's consternation at the time. Continuing uh, the display here of women's riding circa 1900, we focus here on uh, the National Horse Show at Madison Square Garden that became an annual event starting in 1883 for a week in the fall, usually October uh, to November. And it was thought to mark the beginning of the uh, quote unquote indoor season as the wealthy families came back from their summer retreats 
and attended the horse show and uh, many of their prize horse stock were shown in the various classes at the show. So it was all about uh, demonstrating not only riding skill, but also the animals themselves and, and the finely bred ones, uh, all of whom were originally imported. And among the featured breeds at the show was the English thoroughbred. So it, it was an institution that definitely promoted Anglophilic standards of, of equine beauty and equine riding styles and management. And this, of course, is going on at a time when there's uh, huge waves of immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe coming in. So the need to promote that Anglo-American breeding was uh, a big impulse out of fear that somehow um, you know, whiteness would be, would be detracted from amid all of that immigration. And the horse show participated in that. But from the beginning, women were competing in the horse show and riding uh, along with men. And of course, they're doing it still side saddle uh, from the 1880s until 1915 when the National Horse Show authorities finally agreed that yes, women, it's okay if you want to ride side saddle. And the, the National Horse Show was so prestigious that when those authorities decided it was okay, that's really seen as the kind of benchmark for, for uh, making it okay. That's why that's um, a historical marker. Um, this uh, engraving here on the wall is, uh, again, is from Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. This is in fact the edition documenting the, the first horse show in, in 1883 at Madison Square Garden. You can see that woman boldly leaping the fence side saddle. And if you look closely on the rail there, watching her uh, somewhat agape are some of those men who, who were quite fascinated by and a little worried about um, just how, how it was that women were able to do that. She is uh, framed by, at the top there, you can see men examining a draft horse and looking carefully at its conformation, uh, examining the, the solidity of its feet, its teeth, and so on, making sure that um, the, the horse will genuinely be, be able to do what, what they might want to buy it for. And then down here we have young children learning uh, some pointers about horsemanship at the horse show. Here is um, a cover of Harper's Weekly during horse show week, this one from the 1890s. And you can see there on the front, uh, a woman having won uh, an equitation class, actually having beaten uh, some men in that competition. Now, as um, equestrianism for women became more popular as a sport in this period, uh, there, there were uh, manufactured a whole array of kind of high-end equestrian-themed consumer goods because equestrianism was not only a sport for women, but also a lifestyle. So for example, you see here a, a sterling silver, uh, th this is a, a salt and pepper set where we've got you know, the cut crystal uh, containers there for the salt and pepper topped with um, uh, jockey hats uh, in sterling silver. And next to that, uh, a little cut silver cup that was used by ladies for uh, drinking shots of whiskey. So, you know, it might not be too ladylike to, to swill whiskey, but if you drank it out of a little shot glass like that, after having been energized by your, your horse riding, you know, that was considered um, okay. So the, these are uh, some examples of the, the antique high-end equestrian themed goods that, that circulated in women's houses. Now, anybody who rides will tell you that uh, while the ideal might be to look like you're not doing much on the horse, that, that ideally you should be still with good posture uh, and so on, it is a lot of physical exercise. You're really working your core and, and your lower body in communicating with the horse. But of course, ladies are not supposed to sweat what to do. Well, you were supposed to wear uh, a Canfield dress shield 
in your in your armpits to prevent the sweat stains from coming through your finer writing habits. So we have here a newspaper ad for uh, for the Canfield dress shield. And here in the front is an example of the longer ladies riding crop that was used to compensate for the absence of the leg on the right side while riding side saddle. Along with the National Horse Show, uh, the opening of Central Park provided a huge impetus for growth in the sport of riding, especially for women in this time period. So in, in this case, uh, we're featuring again some of these very detailed, beautiful periodical engravings uh, showing some of these practices. And up at the top, you can see a fold-out art supplement to Appleton's Journal, another nationally circulating magazine at the time, showing in minute detail uh, the Grand Drive at Central Park where the moneyed people in Manhattan would show off their fancy carriages and fancy carriage horses. Men, of course, traditionally had driven these carriages either themselves or uh, through the services of hired coachmen, but many chose to do it themselves for the sport, and women likewise got into carriage driving and uh, would do some of that in, in shows and on the park drives. Now all around Central Park, which as you probably know is uh, comprised of some 840 acres in a long narrow rectangle in the middle of Manhattan, so all around the perimeter of the park uh, you had various uh, horse businesses set up, um, horse clothing stores, uh, horse equipment, emporiums, um, and riding stables and riding academies. So women in particular were flocking into these academies, middle and upper class white women, to take riding lessons. This illustration down here gives us a glimpse inside one of those, uh, one of those academies. And this is called uh, Ladies Riding School. And it shows us the progression from the young girl on the right side of the illustration who's there on a pony. Notice that she is riding astride. Okay, so the idea of the progression here is that to learn uh, to manage a horse, you, you start out astride as a small girl. And then as you advance in age and mature, you learn uh, the arts of side saddle and until you become, as it were, a proper lady sitting side saddle. So you can see sort of the stages of that development um, drawn there in the illustration. The young girl is assisted uh, with her pony by the African American stable worker. So that is an area where African Americans were, were working many having come up from the South, having uh, acquired horse skills from agriculture, but bringing those skills into the city and finding work in, in the stables. Um, and then as, as this girl gets older, according to this progression in this illustration, she's going to work her way up and, and finally there will be a, a, a white male bowler-hatted instructor schooling her in, in the proper ways of uh, correct form as a lady riding side saddle. Well, many of those white male instructors were actually uh, military men who learned riding in the cavalry and then brought their military authority to disciplining women into uh, the proper ladylike riding style. So this illustration is uh, a drawing about a progression of gender as well as a progression of whitening. And of course, um, in becoming a lady, you are performing a particular image of social class. Now, in uh, this case, we wanted to try to show some of the things that were going on uh, somewhat underneath the surface that might not have been fully according to the discipline that uh, social propriety might have dictated. So we have juxtaposed some items here. And um, uh, one of the things that went on in Central Park on horseback was courting. 
uh, and we did have an illustration of uh, a man and a woman courting on horseback in Central Park on the cover of Appleton's. And that one's kind of fun because while uh, the man is attempting to impress the woman, the expression on the faces of the two horses is telling us that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe she shouldn't take a, take a liking to him. Um, and, and the woman is probably more likely to listen to her horse uh, than him at this point. Uh, but also in this other illustration here, we can see that it was not only heterosexual uh, courting that went on on horseback, but that there were some allusions to uh, some same-sex attraction here between women uh, mediated by horses. And significantly, that illustration is titled La Mode Parisienne. So the way of riding of the lady on the horse is English side saddle, but, but the implied mode of intimacy between the two is, is French. Uh, occasionally, uh, the horse got um, unruly in, in the course of the exercise and the riding in Central Park, and that's what we're seeing over here where uh, this, this horse has taken off with its lady rider horses being fundamentally unpredictable animals. And while, you know, usually well-mannered if, if properly trained, uh, they, they're still horses. And, you know, if they've been cooped up for a long time and feel frisky or something spooks them, they can certainly run as prey animals. That's their major mode of defense. But part of what's fun about this illustration is that that horse is running like crazy and the lady looks remarkably calm, and it's the policeman who's trying to chase her down uh, in order to catch, catch the horse and stop it. It actually was a major occupation of mounted police in this time period to chase down runaways and, and, and bring them under control, both of riders and of uh, carriage, carriages that were the whole team of horses could bolt with a carriage, which is even more frightening, okay? So we still, you know, horses are providing power and, and they're beautiful animals to show. And if you've got a fancy rig, it, it's, it's a great uh, showcase of your wealth and social status, but it could quickly go the other direction if, if that unpredictable nature of the horse uh, kicked in. Now, uh, one of the things about riding side saddle is that it's not only, you know, asymmetrical, as, as we've discussed, but it's also, um, uh, there, there's a danger to it because with your legs hooked over those pummels, it's hard to break away from the horse uh, should, should the horse fall. And so women actually got caught on the horse and very badly hurt in, in those sorts of circumstances. And sometimes it, when their body did come away from the saddle, their foot could become caught in the stirrup so that when the horse got up and took off because it was scared, the lady could be dragged. And you know that was usually a, a pretty fatal occurrence. So, um, uh, some folks devised what you see here in the case, which is a safety stirrup for side saddle. And this allows um, for the foot to, uh, to go in from this side and the lower arch of that stirrup prevents the foot from slipping all the way through, which is how you would get dragged. And then if you do fall off, if you look at that drawing that we've excerpted from the book next to it, you can see how that, um, that lower arch of the stirrup came apart and broke away to release the foot so that the lady uh, would, would not be dragged. Okay. And we've included in the case uh, a piece of leather horse equipment. Um, this is known as, as a martingale. It was a, a fairly common item to, to put on a horse. The reins thread through it and it helps you um, in, in guiding the horse and, and keeping uh, the horse going straight and not throwing its, its head up. And uh, we included it here because this lady in the picture down on the bottom there, it actually has one on her horse. So you, you can look at the item itself and then see how it's fitted on the horse. This is actually a lady riding side saddle in Iowa. 
it's a wonderful picture because uh, while her saddle is, is English, uh, some of the details of the horse's bridle are actually Western. So it's a great kind of mix of English and Western riding styles inside saddle, uh, which kind of makes sense for the middle of the country as Iowa women tried to take up some of these, these uh, riding trends that were coming out of New York through these nationally circulating magazines. So we wanted to show uh, in this case that um, while much riding did go on in New York City, and you can see uh, again on the cover of Harper's there, Sunday morning on Riverside Drive, you can see those ladies out, out for a morning canter in the park. Okay. The uh, riding also went on outside of the city as some of these ladies would, would head for their country homes on weekends and do things like fox hunt, which they also did side saddle, and which was uh, another very sort of fashionable as well as sporting activity that uh, had its own kind of array of cons high-end consumer goods that they could acquire to show off this life lifestyle. Uh, and that's, so you see this lady here on the left uh, this is, actually, this is a, a picture by Howard Chandler Christie, who was one of the most famous illustrators of the time, there um, in her fox hunting attire with, with uh, her dogs. And notice that the man in the back there, he's, he's the one who's bringing the horse to her while she, while she waits. Um, down here we have a, a, a soup ladle that's sterling silver in the form of a, a hunt cap and a fox hunting whip on the handle. So the actual fox hunting whip is, is laid here um, uh, on, on the floor of the case. And this was something that both men and women carried in the fox hunting field. And you learn to uh, you know, throw the thong out and smack, make it, give it a crack when you bring the, the thong back towards you. Uh, you never use it to hit anybody uh, but uh, sometimes if the hounds get too close to your horse's back legs and you don't want the, the horse to get upset or the hounds to get kicked, you would flick this whip and the crack of it would, would make the hounds move away. But you wouldn't either hit them uh, or, or the horse. But still, it's a pretty powerful thing to carry and wield on horseback, uh, especially if you're a woman. And it was kind of a power move you could do even while sitting in that ladylike mode of side saddle. The, the case here on, on the floor, we have folded a, uh, a horse blanket. This is um, indicative of uh, the wide array of horse clothing that, that people acquired. Um, it actually does have a practical function because horses, of course, are athletes too. They sweat. This type of blanket you would put on a horse that was hot after, after a workout to help them cool off. And often these, these blankets were made with the particular stable colors that uh, signaled the, the identity of, of the farm and the, the people who owned the farm where the horse came from. So it's, it's a practical item, but uh, it's, also, it's also meant for show. And often they had uh, the monogram of the owner and the farm embroidered on the blanket as well. Being that the year of this exhibit is 2020, and being that this is the 100th anniversary of the women's suffrage movement, which reached its culmination during the age of horsepower, we thought it was a given that we needed to include uh, at, at least some portion of the exhibit dedicated to women's suffrage. So we, we in fact refer to this whole corner as Suffrage Corner and we're very grateful to both the Iowa Women's Archives and the State Historical Society of Iowa as well as all the material on the Library of Congress website for uh, giving us the items that you see here in these cases. So we, we start out here by uh, emphasizing the historical timing of the suffrage movement during these peak decades of horsepower, and of course the need for mobility to marshal the campaign. And this was a, a famous suffragist. This is um, Elizabeth Freeman, 
and she is participating, speaking of mobility, in an organized suffrage hike from New York City to Washington, D.C. for the big 1913 suffrage parade. Uh, and there you can see her leading the horse uh, who is pulling what became known as the iconic suffrage wagon that was inscribed with votes for women slogans. And inside the wagon is, is a human coworker uh, bearing pamphlets that were meant to be distributed along the way and, and when they got to uh, the suffrage event. So this, this, um, this type of suffrage wagon, horse-drawn, uh, became iconic and very indicative of, of the motion, the mobility, the advancement of the campaign, which, which could not have been waged without horses. So it was horses and women together who advocated for suffrage. We include with a national figure like Elizabeth Freeman, some artifacts here from, uh, from our, our local collections. So we've got a pamphlet here um, for coming out of one of the, the local Iowa suffrage clubs, um, the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association and then uh, some of the literature that came from the National American Woman Suffrage Association out of New York, but that circulated in Iowa. More than transportation, horses also provided iconic stature and presence in these suffrage events, especially in parades. So parading became a type of performance that was instrumental in the suffrage campaign. And we found here uh, some information about uh, a local Iowa woman who at the age of 90 still insisted that she was going to ride in the suffrage campaign, recognizing that this was uh, an important move for women's rights and also recognizing the power of women being on horseback and marching for suffrage, literally taking the power of horses that for millennia had been the domain of men in military campaigns and now turning it to, to the purpose of advancing women's cause. So at 90, indeed, uh, she did ride in, in the suffrage parade in Waterloo. And we accompany her, uh, that article, with some more uh, uh, memorabilia from the suffrage campaign. We've got uh, some of the, the buttons here that were distributed and worn. And here's uh, another a program from the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association, this one from the 48th Annual Convention in 1919. Uh, the iconic yellow votes for women badge and ribbon, and of course uh, a horseshoe because the horses had to be shod if they were marching in parades, often on paved streets. That was the whole point of, of horseshoes was to protect the feet of working horses and they were doing a, a vital job in these, in these suffrage parades. We feature in this case uh, documentation of the first recorded suffrage parade in Iowa, which took place in the town of Boone in 1908. And this is uh, the only photograph that we have from this event, so it's been widely reproduced. And when you first look at it, you think that, well, th there aren't any horses in this picture, uh, it's just humans marching for suffrage, but actually, if you look a little more closely, you see that there are in fact two horse-drawn vehicles behind. It's hard to tell exactly what they are, but um, you know, they're definitely horses pulling them. You can see the dust coming up off the dirt road there. And even more tellingly, if you look closely in the foreground, you can see that there are horse droppings on the road, obviously uh, evidence of, of the horses having gone before. So I, I would argue that, that horses were participating in this uh, uh, milestone Iowa suffrage event as well. And that's why we included a bit from uh, a horse's bridle in this case to uh, further signify their presence. 
and are also displaying, um, again, some of the national literature from the suffrage campaign, uh, the flyer from the National American Woman Suffrage Association that uh, has the headline, Woman Suffrage Co-Equal with Man Suffrage. This was perhaps the single most visible icon of the American women's suffrage campaign. This is Inez Milholland riding uh, the horse Gray Dawn in that famous Washington DC suffrage parade that was held in March of 1913 on the eve of the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson. So on, on this very striking white horse, she cuts a most impressive figure. Uh, the horse himself is gorgeous. Look at the, the beautiful eye and expression and ears on this horse. And we happen to have a bridle that's very similar to the one that she's using on Grey Dawn here. So you get a sense of the actual uh, tactile quality of, of the leather and uh, this soft, soft metal in the horse's mouth that she's using. Now, mind you, uh, this is a very spirited animal and she was quite a talented equestrian to be able to manage a horse like this on the street in all the chaos of the parade was, was quite an equestrian feat. And notice that she is sitting astride. And that was a very, potent symbolic move given everything we've talked about in terms of the, the social requirement about women riding side saddle that uh, by in 1913 it was still de rigueur for women to do. We haven't gotten to that declaration yet from the National Horse Show Association that it was okay for them to ride astride. So she's very much uh, on this white horse which many military male generals also rode for visibility to be able to see the commander in front on the white horse. That's what she's doing here on Grey Dawn, riding astride just like a military commander. Part of the inspiration for this iconography came from Joan of Arc, uh, the, the medieval woman who of course was one of the great uh, female generals of all time. Uh, who also rode astride on a white horse. So just as Joan of Arc led the battalion at Orléans, so Inez Milholland leads it on Grey Dawn in this uh, striking picture. Now we wanted, uh, we took this image from the Library of Congress and we wanted to display it at life size. Again, continuing our uh, ideas about the importance of scale in trying to give audiences today some sense of, of the power and presence of these animals and, and what they could do for human power and identity in this period. Back here in Suffrage Corner, we've got a few more images um, out of necessity having to be at smaller scale uh, for the display, but, but meant to amplify uh, your, your sense of what these suffrage parades were like. Um, so here is uh, Inez Milholland. Uh, you've got a little more information about her. Um, now, she uh, sadly passed away very young at age 30 after this very brilliant career as, as a college woman who then became an attorney uh, advocated on behalf of women's rights and African-American rights, and but she suffered from anemia and was actually on her way to lead another suffrage campaign when she was stricken and, and passed away at the age of 30. So the movement lost, uh, lost a great leader. Okay. But we do have quite a number of photographs of her because she was such, such a striking figure out in public. Uh, she not only rode Grey Dawn in the parades that she participated in, but also this uh, beautiful chestnut horse here uh, in, in a parade in New York City. And here is um, an illustration of Joan of Arc on the white horse advertising uh, the, the suffrage parade. And then of course, Milholland uh, performed that iconography 
when she rode the White Horse Grey Dawn in DC on March 3rd, 1913. Here are some other pictures from that parade. And you can see here a whole phalanx of women uh, who would then have come uh, behind Milholland, all seated resolutely astride with the Capitol building behind them uh, advocating for suffrage. Now, uh, part of the iconography, of course, of Milholland on the white horse, like uh, Joan of Arc, was its whiteness. So among its other symbolic dimensions, it also indicates uh, the, the whiteness of the American women's suffrage campaign and uh, a number of the leaders of the campaign, uh, in fact, um, uh, chose to, to emphasize whiteness uh, in order to curry favor with Southern politicians in order to get their support. As a result of that, uh, black women's participation in the women's suffrage campaign was, uh, was curtailed. And so black women had to uh, advocate even harder to try to have their rightful place and voice in the campaign. One of the black women who did find a place in uh, the, this suffrage parade was Ida B. Wells. Like white women, black women combined their advocacy for suffrage with other causes, but they also had to combat racial discrimination in the predominantly white national women's suffrage campaign and in the country at large. Nevertheless, black women persisted by organizing on their own and taking part in some white-led suffrage events. Prominent anti-lynching activist and suffragist Ida B. Wells Barnett representing the Chicago-based Alpha Suffrage Club, was asked to march at the rear of the 1913 DC suffrage parade with other black suffragists. Asserting her rightful place, she stepped into line with the white Illinois de delegation. No black women, however, gained the privilege of riding horseback in the parade. So opposite the photograph of Inez Mulholland, the iron-jawed angel on horseback, we have another uh, life-size photograph reproduction, uh, this of an unidentified African-American soldier on horseback. Uh, he is uh, shown uh, wearing a holstered pistol and also an overseas cap. So we believe that uh, he uh, was serving in Europe uh, and likely in France sometime in either 1917 or 1918. Um, with the, the photograph, which is from the Library of Congress, uh, enlarged, we can see that the horse's legs are uh, kept shaggy uh, to protect them, uh, whereas the rest of the horse uh, is, uh, the horse's hair is cut short. Uh, from his uh, chevrons on his sleeve, uh, it, it appears that he is uh, an, a non-commissioned officer, likely a sergeant. Um, and so uh, whether or not he was trained, uh, trained there, it's likely that his superior officers were trained at Fort Des Moines in Iowa. The four African-American soldiers pictured here are at Fort Des Moines. Built in 1901 and dedicated as a cavalry post in 1909, Fort Des Moines became the designated federal training camp for black officers beginning in May 1917, after the U.S. entered the war. And the NAACP lobbied for more black men to be able to lead their compatriots in battle. According to the Des Moines Register, on June 17, 1917, 1,200 black soldiers were sworn into the Provisional Army Officer Training School by Colonel Charles C. Ballou. In October 15, the fort graduated 639 men, including 106 captains, 329 first lieutenants, and 204 second lieutenants. Commanded by officers from Fort Des Moines, the 92nd Division went into action against the German offensive after just eight weeks of training and was a force in the fierce battles in France until the armistice, historical records show. 
At least seven of the officers were cited for bravery and awarded medals. From the National Cavalry Training at Fort Des Moines and parading in Iowa City, we turn back to women's equestrian ventures with uh, these two Iowa-born sisters of the early 20th century, Marie Rumble and her younger sister, Pearl, who were two of the eight children of Clarence Rumble and Pearl Dodge, all raised on a horse-powered farm near Mount Vernon, Iowa. Their joint horsey adventures gave rise to this volume in our display here, uh, this book called Homestead on the Range, A Tenderfoot Girl in Wyoming, which was authored by Pearl under her married name, Merrick, and published in 1994. So in this book, uh, Pearl gives a, a fictionalized account, but one rooted very, in a very detailed way in her experience in the early 20th century with her sister Marie. Because what happened with Marie was that she had to leave an abusive marriage in Iowa, move west with her firstborn daughter to start a new life on a 640 acre homestead near Cheyenne, Wyoming. Rumble's youngest sister, Pearl, who was only a few years older than Rumble's own daughter, spent summers visiting the homestead. The two sisters together broke ponies and rode calves in Cheyenne's annual rodeo. Um, Pearl eventually returned to Iowa and retired from a long teaching career at Roosevelt Junior High in Cedar Rapids and then at Kirkwood Community College. Her sister's letters, as well as the manuscript of this book and Pearl's other writings, are contained in the Marie Rumble papers in the Iowa Women's Archives. Among those writings is also her handwritten account of their brother Earl's death in 1918 from the flu pandemic. Also included in this case uh, is, a, is an autographed book of Gwendolyn Johnson Hine from the Iowa Women's Archives. And it's a nice uh, story about uh, young people and their horses Gwendolyn Johnson Hine uh, was a basketball player, a seed store operator, and farm woman, and was born in 1911, one of four children of William and Emma Johnson of Newhall, Iowa. Um, along with her friend Luella Gardeman Bodiker, she joined the school basketball team, uh, and after the 1924 State Girls High School School Championship Tournament, the Iowa High School Athletic Association announced that they were eliminating the state tournament for girls basketball. Gwen Johnson and Luella Gardeman rode horses from farm to farm to convince neighbors to support the continuation of the girls basketball tournaments. Before the next year, school officials founded the Iowa Girls High School Athletic Union that sponsored the 1925 tournament. Newspaper accounts of Newhall's victory in the 1927 state tournament are located in the collection. Several photographs and documents in this case represent how horseback riding was offered by the University of Iowa women's athletics as a club sport in the late 1950s. University women riders were bused to Winds Reach Farm off of Knott's Lane in the northeast of Iowa City. The proprietor and instructor was Betsy Coaster, a European-trained expert in dressage and jumping who was herself a UI graduate and founder of the Rapid Creek Pony Club. With her husband, Fritz Coaster, a longtime faculty member at the University of Iowa in theoretical physics, Betsy had six children whom she also trained in horsemanship and a couple of whom still work the farm and teach riding out there at, at Winds Reach. These photographs show the university women learning to ride through the various gates. Note that all are riding astride, hence the pair of stirrups in the case, unlike the single safety stirrup we saw over there uh, for, for the side saddle. We've also included a release form that the women had to sign in order to uh, get on the horses out at Winds Reach um, because horseback riding, for all of its benefits, does carry inherent risk. 
as well as some of the mimeographed, that was the technology then in the 50s, uh, mimeographed information sheets for the women to study, and then a mimeographed multiple choice test that the women had to take. And uh, these, are, these are quite fun to look at. For example, on a multiple choice question, uh, Betsy Coaster asks, the blacksmith should check a horse's foot often because hooves grow like fingernails. Why should shoes be reset every four to six weeks and barefoot horses' hooves trimmed. A, it improves the action and gives the horse a neater appearance, which is important in show work. B, it keeps the foot from cracking up or becoming deformed and prevents faulty action resulting from neglect. C, it prevents thrush, which is a, a disease of the frog caused by neglect. D, it improves action and keeps the sole from wearing. Those are the options on the test. Well, these mimeograph tests require that the women master a certain amount of book knowledge of equine anatomy, health, and equipment, but primarily in learning to ride, they were learning a certain physical discipline and way of being in their bodies with horses. The 1950s was a socially conservative time for women, like the suffrage era. For those who were privileged enough to take up horse riding, especially in the context of a college education, the embodied experience of horsepower and learning successful communication with these huge sensitive creatures built confidence for pursuing careers and advancing women's rights and other social justice causes. I was a toddler when these pictures were taken and I was soon to feel what these women were feeling in the saddle and working around horses. So for me, they provide a kind of bridge back to the era before the internal combustion engine when horses were both essential and ubiquitous. So we hope that this exhibit has helped give you a greater understanding of how the presence of horses shapes society and human identities. We hope you've been inspired to think historically about what coexisting and moving with all these equine bodies felt like in and around the city and how all those cross-species physical interactions affected people's bodies and lives. And we hope that the multidimensionality of the exhibit, combining objects with texts and images and inviting you to consider the scale and mobility of horses has opened up your historical imaginations as well. Perhaps in the process, as we have, you too have been inspired to think about and even retrace the paths that so many horses once trod in Iowa City and New York City and your own cities. Through horses, we can connect not only with the past, but also more deeply with our sense of place and how we physically inhabit it.